Well, good morning. It's great to see you guys this morning. Uh, the book of Psalms says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I don't know if whatever stuff you brought in with you th from this past week or whatever's, heading, whatever's coming your way this next week, but you need to know that Jesus Christ is in the middle of your life and in the middle of your story, and he is guiding you, he is faithful to lead you, and that he loves you, and that no matter what happens, his love is unfailing and never changing. And so that's good news for me anyway. I don't know about you. So I have all the reason in the world to praise Jesus. I hope you do too. So if you'll stand with me, we'll pray, and we'll begin to worship together. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity we have just to come together and, and, and to fellowship together, to worship you and lift up Jesus together. God, we're grateful for your grace and your mercy, Lord, that we haven't deserved any of it, and yet you have looked at us and set your love and your affection on us, that you would send your son to go to the cross and to die and rise again so we would have real new life. I pray this morning that you would just inhabit our praises. I pray that everything we do would be would, would would put the spotlight on Jesus, and God, that we would be reminded of your presence, your faithfulness, your goodness, all the work that you're doing in our lives. God, I pray again that uh, this time would be a blessing to our hearts, and Lord, that as we worship you and as we look in your word again about the, the beauty and the glorious reality of heaven, I pray that it would encourage us, it would bring comfort to us, and Lord, it would just give us a desire to walk with you and to look forward to a beautiful future that we have with Jesus. God, thank you so much, and we pray that you bless this time, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you can see, I'm not going to be yelling, good morning, Frida, <laughs> but good morning, Freedom. It's good to have you all here this morning, and just be praying for Matt as he's away on a vacation, and let's worship together. Addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus, because your name is power, your name is healing, your name. Your name is healing, your 
Reach out, Jesus, from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus.
that you've even gone to win my war. Your love becomes my greatest defense. It leads me from the dry wilderness. And all I did was pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this day, and we thank you for the power of the name of Jesus, the mighty name, that at every tongue, every tribe, every nation will bow and proclaim you as Lord of Lords, King of Kings and Lord of Lords of the whole world and the universe. And we look forward to the day as we anxiously await the glory of heaven to be with you for all eternity. Please bless Dustin as he brings the message now. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. 
Man, it's great to see you guys. Here we are. July is almost over, if you can believe it. And school's about to start back. Things are about to kind of get back normal, maybe, for some of us. And so here in uh, this, on this July Sunday morning, let me invite you to turn me in your Bibles or your Bible apps to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That's where we're starting this morning. We started a new sermon series a couple of weeks ago talking about heaven. And, uh, and uh, what, what we typically do is stay in one passage of Scripture, but today in the last couple of weeks, we've been jumping all throughout the Bible to look at what the Bible says about our future. In a world full of bad news, there is really, really good news, and it's this, that because of the grace of Jesus Christ, Jesus holds your future in his hands. That, your hand, that in his hands, your future is secure. That you don't know what tomorrow holds, but God does. And God, and God is faithful to walk with you and to be with you and to lead you through, no, through anything, no matter what happens in your future. And so here's the deal. We're talking about heaven. And the question is why? Two reasons. Number one, number one, because as a human being, you were created, and every human being is created to, to spend eternity somewhere, that you are made to live forever. The only question is, is where? And that is based on your decision, whether you accept you re- or you reject Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So you are made for forever. It's just a matter of where. Eternity is in your future. Is it with God or is it not? So in the second reason we're talking about heaven is because eternity is closer than you think. We may ask the question, why are we talking about something that seems so far away? But here's the reality, is that with every tick of the clock, someone dies. There is one tick of the clock that's got my name on it. There's one tick of the clock that has your name on it. That you have an appointment with Jesus. And, and, and heaven, standing before Jesus, can, can, can be closer than your next breath. That, that next breath is not promised. And so in a world full of bad news as Christians, we want to be encouraged. We want, to be, we want our faith to be strengthened. We want to know that there is something better than all of the pains and troubles and frustrations of this world. There is a glorious future that you have in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we're going to talk about what that future holds. Hey, listen, as we live this life, maybe 60, 70, 80 years it comes and it goes that, that, that what we have in Jesus, what we have here is that we know that this life is just a journey to home, that death is a doorway. Death does not have the final say for us. And so this morning, t- what does life look like in heaven? We've talked about what heaven is. It's a kingdom. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a city. It's a home. It's a garden. It's a party. But what will life be like there in heaven? And today we're talking about relationships. So if you'll stand with me, we'll read one verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's verse 17, and we'll get our time started in the Word. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. The Apostle Paul writes, and he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, meaning if you believe in him, if you have trusted in his death on the cross, for, for your life, to pay for your sins. If, if, he, if you believe in his resurrection, meaning that he arose, and because he has risen to life, we are alive. If anyone is in Christ, he says, he is a new creation. He is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. That's you, church, a new creation in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you again so much for this time of worship we had this morning. God, we're grateful again for everything you do for us. Every, every, everything that we are aware of, everything that we're not aware of, Lord, we know that it's all because of your love, your grace, your mercy towards us. And I pray this morning as we continue looking at the future that we have in Jesus, in heaven, Lord, I pray that it would encourage us. Lord, that maybe somebody here this morning is struggling. I pray that it would fill them with hope, comfort, peace, joy to know that in the end, everything is going to be okay. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for, the, for the, this future that we have. And we pray that you would bless your word and it would encourage our hearts as well. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So, so there are three relationships in your life that you experience right now 
that you will experience in heaven, but it's going to be even better. Now, some of your relationships right now are pretty good. You can't imagine how, you know, how things can get better. You're newlywed. You're infatuated with your spouse. Oh, they're perfect, right? Well, you'll find out they're not, but it's going to get even better, right, in heaven. And so, so maybe you, you've, you've met some new friends or you've got a new job and you're excited about your boss or your coworker. Maybe you're a new Christian and, you, and your relationship with God is fresh and you're excited about having a relationship with God. Hey, can I tell you something? That the relationships that you experience in this life are going to get even sweeter, even better, even more beautiful in the future for you. So three that we're going to talk about this morning. The first one is this. Is there, is, this is the relationship you have with yourself. It's that you will be a new creation. You will be a new creation. Ever have a hard time getting up out of bed in the morning? You ever, you ever, and then have a long day at work and, and, you, and, and you go to bed and you're exhausted and then you wake up the next morning and you can't even get your feet on the floor, right? Ever have those moments? Ever have the moments where, you, where you're wondering why there's always a different body part that hurts, it seems? You know, like one day it's your shoulder, one day it's your knee, one day it's your back, and you're, you never, you're always in a constant state of pain or aching, right? Maybe there's, maybe there's a, a spiritual or emotional pain that there's something going on in your heart or your mind that, 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 that people can't see and you can't see it, but you know it's there and it's, it's bothering you, it's plaguing you. You know there's, a, there's, a, there's something that, whether it's anxiety or depression or it's something going on in your heart and your mind, and you know that everything is not okay as it is right now. There's good news if that's you. That in heaven you will totally be remade. That you will be a new creation in heaven. That you will be brand new. I know some of us like to tinker with things. Maybe you like to re, maybe you remodel houses. Maybe you rebuild cars. You know, and as you renovate vehicles or you have little projects that you do, you buy things one piece at a time and you kind of put stuff together as you go along, as you can afford it, as you go along. Uh, Johnny Cash has a song. It's called One Piece at a Time. And, he, and, he, and he's, a, he's a factory worker in the song, right? And he works for GM or whoever. And, and every day, he just takes one piece of a car home with him. One day, it's a tire. Another day, it's, it's a carburetor. Another day, it's a steering wheel. And the next thing you know, tw in 20 years, he's got a brand new car, right? And he just takes one piece at a time, right? We band-aid things together in life like that. Can I encourage you that God does not do that with your life? That God is not band-aiding you together. God is recreating you, making you a new creation in Jesus. Not just merely an upgraded model, but someone brand new in Christ. That's the beauty of what God does in our hearts and our lives. And so in Jesus, we are a new creation. Again, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That God is at work in your life. That God is, God is doing a new thing in your life. And then you will have a brand new life at some point in the future. Here's the reality of what Paul is saying is that the moment you believed in Jesus, the moment that you trusted him, his death uh, on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, his resurrection from the grave defeating death so you can live what jesus did in that moment that you believed is that he put the holy spirit in your heart and life the indwelling holy spirit and ephesians 1 says verse 13 and 14 that the holy spirit seals you and guarantees you for a glorious future that you are kept, you are secure, that your life has been stamped with the approval of God, that God has is, God is created and he has promised a future for you. So he's at work in your life right now. God is transforming us. God is maturing us. God is making us more like Jesus now. I'm a work in progress, and you are too, amen? So you are, you are a work in progress. My life says under construction, but it's God doing the constructing, not me. Okay, and so, so that's our lives. We're being remade new, and there's coming a day we cross the finish line of this life, and we will finally fully realize this brand new creation God created us to be, that, that he is changing us right now. And when you cross the finish line, when you pass through death, you walk into more life, and you will be totally new, totally new. So what does it mean that I'm, new, I'm a new creation? 
What does it mean? Like, how does it, what has it translate to my life in heaven? Like, what will it be like in heaven? Like, what, who will I be in heaven? What will I experience? Well, the first thing that you'll experience is that you, it means that you will still be you. You will be a new creation, but you will still be uniquely you. You have a God-given identity, and, and that does not go away in eternity. We do not lose our, our identities. We do not become faceless people in a crowd in heaven that instead uh, we still keep our God-given identity. Check this out. After the, after the resurrection of Jesus, he goes to the disciples, and they're all huddled up into a little room, and they're afraid for their lives, and they're not sure what their future holds, and they thought they were following Jesus, and he died. We don't know what's going to happen now, and like people are going to hunt after us and kill us next. And so, the, so, so they're huddled up in an upper room. Jesus appears to the disciples, and here's what he says to them in uh, Luke 24, 39. Jesus says, see my hands and feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones that, as you see that I have. After his death, after his resurrection, Jesus is still Jesus. In Luke chapter 16, Matthew chapter 11, you see Jesus calling people by their name. Lazarus was a poor man who was mistreated, but he, but he trusted God, and so he's in paradise. So Lazarus, you see uh, Jesus refer to, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I, me, Dustin Wallace, I will still be Dustin Wallace in heaven, except all of the broken, um, unsatisfactory parts of my life, the, the frail, sinful, broken parts of my life, those will be anymore. So you will still be you in heaven, just minus all the bad stuff, <laughs> right? And so, so, so it's a new creation. You, have, you will still have your identity. When Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, they go to, the, to the, what the Bible calls the Mount of Transfiguration. It's a, it's a special private mountaintop that Jesus showed those three disciples his true identity. He says, I'm going to show you guys who I really am. And he shows them his glory. And two other men appear in that situation. A man named Moses and a man named Elijah. Now, Peter, James, and John have never seen Moses and Elijah. They've never, they've never walked into their uh, restaurant and, and, sh and shaken their hand. They've never had a face-to-face encounter, encounter with Moses and Elijah. And yet, there they were talking to Jesus, and, and the disciples recognize it's Moses and Elijah. Because you, in heaven, you will still keep your identity. You will still be who you are. It will just be better. They, they recognize Moses and Elijah. They were clothed with glory. And so for us, we will still be who we are here, just perfected. Okay? And so let me just cl clear this up for us as well, that we don't become angels when we die and go to heaven. I know that, we, I know that maybe you said that, or maybe you know somebody who says that. Somebody's gained their wings and they're angels now. Let me encourage you that 1 Corinthians 6 says that we will judge angels, that we don't become angels. Being a human being in a relationship with Jesus is way better than being an angel. You will be over angels, okay? So the point, though, is you will still be you, but you will be perfect. You will be perfectly human, that you will be everything God originally created you to be, everything God designed for you to be. So you'll still be humans just remade in perfection. Also, being a new creation in heaven means that you'll have a new body. Now, again, if you experience pain and aching and problems in your body, then you, then you, you hear that and you say, well, I've been, you know, finally, I'm wondering when this pain and these nagging problems will go away. They'll go away in heaven. You have a new body in, in heaven as you live. And so, when Jesus rose again, he had a physical, literal body. He literally, physically rose again from death. And so doubting Thomas, one of my favorite disciples, because Thomas was a skeptic. Thomas had questions. Thomas didn't always find it easy to believe. And I find myself to be just like doubting Thomas. And so doubting Thomas says, Thomas, won't call him doubting Thomas all the time. Thomas says, um, he says, I won't believe that Jesus is really alive unless I can touch him, right? Sometimes we want proof of things. And so 
So he says, I won't believe that he really rose again unless I could touch him. I want to I I touch his body. I want to feel where the nails and the spear went into his body. I want to know that he's really alive again. And so Jesus appears to Thomas and with a physical, literal, resurrected, glorified body. He has one. And what that means is, is that you and I will have a new body too. 1 Corinthians 15 talks a lot about having a new body in heaven. You know, that, that, that's, what we're, that's what we're going to be spending our existence is in a new perfect body. And so in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52 says this, to make it clear. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body, in other words, my body's dying. Every day my body's, I'm one step closer to, to the grave. One, every day my, my body is starting slowly to break down. So, as, so he, says, he says, for this perishable body, which is not going to live forever, this perishable body must, must put on the imperishable this mortal body must put on immortality. In other words, you will have a better changed body that is created to live forever, okay? Philippians 3, Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven. Aren't you glad that, that you have a place where you belong and it's not just here in the places that you experience now, but there is a, there is a residence for you to belong in heaven. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to even subject all things to himself. So you're going, man, I'm going to have a new body, but what will I look like in heaven? Will I be young and beautiful? Will I have, will I have the physique that I'm looking for? Will I look like I fit on, on the cover of men's like muscle and fitness? Like, what will I look like in heaven, Right? Great question, and I'm glad you asked it this morning. So, <laughs> so what will I look like in heaven? Well, here's what we, here, we only can piece what we have in Scripture together, but here's what we kind of know, is that Revelation 5 and Revelation 7 talks about different nationalities and languages and ethnicities being in heaven. So do, will we all look the same? No, I don't think so. I think that I think wherever your nationality or your ethnicity is, I think you'll get you'll carry that into heaven. You'll be unique in that way. That every tribe, tongue, and language is around the throne worshiping God. So, in other words, I think that we won't look the same. We'll still be distinct in that way. Now, I'm speculating here, but based on that, I'm speculating that it seems that short people will still be short to some degree. Tall people still be tall. If you're thin, you still may be thin. If you're a little on the thicker side, you may be a little thicker, okay? Like, you still may be there. But here's the deal. Here's the thing about it. But like we said a moment ago, you will be recognizable. People will, you will, you will be noticed as you are now, except you'll be healthy and beautiful, and it'll be perfect, right? Like, like that you'll still be uniquely you with this body, but it'll be perfect. And, and, and it seems based on what we see in the book of Revelation, that we'll be able to see, touch, taste, smell, and hear. Okay? Now, how old will we be in heaven? Now, people have a lot of theories on how old we'll be in heaven. Can I, can I encourage you that, that the answer ultimately is, is from Scripture, we don't know. However, however, let me say this. We do see children in heaven. Because like some, some people say we'll, we'll be like the age of like, maturity, like 30 years old, and we'll be kind of like that young, strong, 30-year-old, like forever. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. But there will be children in heaven. Isaiah 11, Isaiah 65 talk about children playing around a, a snake's den and never being bitten, playing with animals and never, never being in danger. Isn't that interesting? So maybe we are the same age that we die here in this life there, but we will we won't have all the complications we have. That we'll, we'll, we'll still be mature, we'll be beautiful, and yet we'll be eternally youthful. The energy, right? Sometimes that's what I hear about people who, who, are, who are aging a little bit, right? You miss some of the vigor and the energy. You, man, I, used to, I used to be able to go and go and go when I was 20 and 30 and 40. But then I've had to slow down as I've gotten older, right? Well, in heaven, you'll be eternally youthful. 
There'll be energy. There'll be joy. There'll be so much for us to do. And so more on that, that's part two next week. But, but the beautiful thing is, is that we will be perfect. Whatever age, whatever our bodies look like, it will be a physical body. It'll be perfect. Now, you'll have a new heart and a new nature, meaning that you'll still have emotions. Will you cry in heaven? Maybe, maybe tears of joy. Now, we do know that when we see, when we are before the face of God, that God will wipe away every tear. So apparently, we have emotions at some point, to some level. Maybe they won't be like what we have here, but we have emotions, right? So and we'll have joy. We'll worship God with joy. We'll be like, man, I can't believe we made it here. Isn't it incredible? He let me in here, right? It's like you feel like you, like you won the lottery, like you snuck in, right? And so that's all by the grace of Jesus. And so, so we'll, have, we'll have joy there, and we'll have new desires, good desires that please the Lord. There won't be sinful desires like we have now, right? Broken sinful desires. The reason is, is because sin won't exist anymore there. Revelation 21.4. The former things have passed away. Meaning that on the cross, Jesus, he defeated sin and death. He, his blood covers our sin. That He took our sin. He bore it as a sacrifice so we could go free in heaven that there won't be sin. He paid it in full. Which is why Revelation 21, 27 promises, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, enter heaven. Nothing unclean nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Satan, death, sin, all those things are gone. They won't trouble you anymore. They won't, they won't be a nuisance. They won't be stumbling blocks. They won't hinder the life that you were created for with God. That, that there's no way for, to be tempted because sin, there won't be any sin to tempt you there in heaven. That it's a, it, It'll be a thing of the past that 1 Corinthians 15 says that we'll be incorruptible. Verse 52, we'll be incorruptible. Our bodies will be incorruptible. That, 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 that it, won't even be, it won't even be an alternative there. We'll be free from the presence of sin and the power of sin. That our hearts will be clean. We'll desire what is good and, and we'll enjoy it. It will be perfect. Now you're asking the question, okay, man, Dustin, I'm hearing you. So we're going to have a new body to live this new life in heaven. I've got a new heart. and I got, I mean, I've got some new emotions, some new desires. Like, what if, like, can I fly in heaven? Like, maybe I desire to fly. Maybe I want to walk through walls in heaven. Well, let me just say this, okay? When I say, when I say that we have new desires and we have new bodies, I don't mean that we entered into a Marvel movie, Okay? <laughs> You're not Iron Man, or, you, and you're, or you're not Thor, okay? That's not, who, that's not what happens, right? And so I believe that we're still a little limited, okay, a little limited. We're not God, but we're a little limited. But there'll be no disease. There'll be no troubles. We'll be new creations in Christ. That's relationship number one, that you will be a new creation. Relationship number two, that you will see God face to face. Now, let me just go ahead and tell you up front, this is... This relationship, in my opinion, is the hardest one for me to describe for you this morning. And the reason is because Scripture gives us a very limited uh, amount of revelation as to what it means that we'll see God in heaven. Now, of course, we know he's going to be there. Otherwise, it wouldn't be heaven, right? So, like, he's going to be there, but what does it mean? Like, how will, my, how will my very imperfect relationship with God improve? What will it be like to see Jesus, to go and just have your breath taken away at, at the one who saved you and changed your life. You'll go. I mean, like, there, there's an awe. There's an, there's, an, there's, a, there's an awareness of all of, of his beauty and his power and his, his splendor. And we'll see him and we'll say, wow, he really is worthy of my worship there. But what, so it's hard to describe, but let me, let me try to do my best for you this morning. In John 17, Jesus prayed this prayer. Verse 24. Father, I desire that they... Also, who are they? He tells you, whom you have given me. So in other words, us Christians, like us, his people, right? So I desire that we all, I don't think Jesus what a Southerner. I desire y'all. I can't wait to see y'all in heaven. So like whom you have given me, us, that y'all may be with me where I am to see my glory. That you may be with me where I am to see my glory. 
that you have that that you have given me because you have loved me. Talking about the to the Father before the foundation of the world. You see a relationship with Jesus. That's personal. That there's a presence. There is there's a real there's a real intimacy and relationship we have. I mean, it's not rituals. It's not doing seven good deeds today and helping the lady across the street walk across with her groceries. It's not, it's not a system of religious rules and activity. It's a real, vibrant, ongoing relationship with God. And so, and so it's personal here. Jesus comes to establish a personal relationship that we lost because of sin. He wants us to really know him. To, fight, to have our sins forgiven, to walk in his freedom, to walk in his power. That's what we were created for. That's what you were made for. That's your purpose. You were made for that relationship. And so it's a relationship. And as we've said before, heaven is a, it's about a person and a place. It's a place we live because the person we love is there. That heaven is so wonderful because Jesus is there. If he's not there, it's not heaven. That wherever he is, that's where heaven is. If he's not there, I want to go somewhere else. I want to go wherever he is. He's the one that saved me. He's the one that changed my life. He's the one that has been so good to me and blessed me over and over again. I want to see him so I can thank him, right? And so, and so I, we want to be where he is. His presence makes heaven heaven, Okay? that we will be there in his presence in that perfect place. I think about in the very beginning when God created Adam and Eve, he created Adam and Eve to walk with them in the Garden of Eden. I mean, when Adam and Eve sinned, they heard the Lord calling out their name, walking in, in the cool of the garden. Imagine how close that relationship was. That's, 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 that's the closeness we're talking about. And so he, he, that, that he wants to walk with us. And by the way, friend, today... We can walk with God, and God can walk with us. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that awesome? That God can walk with you in your life, never to leave your side ever, 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 because you're trusting in his son. You've been reconnected to the power source. That you're in with Jesus. you got faith in him. You're, you've repented, confessed, believed. You're saying, man, here I am, Lord. And like because of that, he was, he, he's always with you, never to leave you or forsake you. No matter where you are, no matter where you live, no matter what you're going through, no matter how big your problems are, God is bigger. Right? He's faithful to lead us. And so in heaven, it gets even more personal. Here's what it, it, here's in heaven it's a it's a it's a direct face to face relationship. You see right now we walk by faith not by sight. Now we trust Jesus even though we've never seen Jesus. Now some people maybe myself when I was in high school not a believer somebody who had grown really hard hearted to God somebody who had really even I would say hated the idea of religion and hated the idea of God I suppressed that deep into my heart. Uh, and it made me, I just, I couldn't stand uh, just even talking about it sometimes or hearing people talk about it. But like, I would have asked this question and I think it's good for us. Like some people may say, it's illogical to believe in something you can't see. But it's not illogical to believe that DNA exists or that gravity exists or that the wind exists, even though you've never seen gravity, but you don't float off into the sky. Even though you've never seen the wind, you've just seen the effects of the wind and how it takes your shingles off your house. I mean, so like you've never seen the wind. The, you, never, you never caught wind on your video camera or your security camera at home, your ring doorbell. Wind's never driven by, right? But you believe it exists, right? You've seen the effects of it, right? So, so we've seen, we have tasted, seen, we've experienced the grace of God in our lives. We've seen it in the lives of other people. We've seen, it, we've seen it personally in our lives. So right now, we walk by faith. We know how God, I know how God's changed my life. And when we walk by faith, when we trust him, when we look to his word, we live in the, in the power of the spirit. We, 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 we see how God has changed our lives. Now, one day, our faith will become sight. When you step foot into eternity, you'll see him. Like, you're, like you'll have new eyes. Like some of our eyes are kind of, you know, we're losing some of that long distance. Maybe you can't see up close. You got to have bifocals or whatever. Like, like you have some new eyeballs. 
okay? And you will, and your new eyes will be able to see and comprehend and, and, and fully embrace with all that God is. You're saying, man, why can't we see him now? That's a great question. Moses asked God that question back in Exodus 33. Moses said, God, Lord, you've given me the Ten Commandments. If anybody should be able to see your face, I'm your guy, right? I mean, like, you've called me. I'm the guy. I got the Ten Commandments. I come off the mountain. I, you got, I got two million Jewish people here. Like, I am, I mean, we're close, right? Like, you can, like, peel back the curtain and let me see who you are. Let me see your face. Let me see your glory, Moses asked for. And in Exodus 33, uh, 19, God says this. I will, I will, he hides Moses in the cleft of the rock. I'll tell you why that is in a second. I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So I'll, I, if I want to, I'll let you know. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Can you imagine how disappointed Moses would have felt? I mean, Lord, I thought we had a, a special connection here. I thought we kind of, I thought, you know, I was your boy. You know, I thought, I thought maybe, you know, you were hook me up with some special insider information. I was going to get to see some stuff. And yet, he doesn't. Why, why, why do we walk by faith and not by sight right now? Because God is so holy that he, don't, he can't look upon sin and, without judgment. That's why we needed Jesus. Right, to take our sins away. God's glory is so, is so incredible. It's so incomprehensible. We can't even begin to fathom it. Like our frail dust bodies couldn't even with all of our brokenness, we couldn't bear to see how awesome God is. It would literally take your breath away. Literally, you would die, God says. You would die. You couldn't, you couldn't withstand to see his beauty, power, and glory. You couldn't do it in this sinful body. It can't happen. So we have glimpses. We have glimpses, but one day we'll see Jesus face to face. We'll go to, when we go live in God's house in heaven, we'll see him there. Revelation 22, 4 says, they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. What does it mean to see God's face? Man, number one, it means worship. More about that next week, but worship. But number two, I got, I got a, here's what I think it means to, to see God face to face. It's one word, access. Access. You know, like you go to concerts, you can buy backstage passes, right? And you can like see your, ba your favorite band and Instagram your stories and like show like how, how awesome you are and you got to meet Leonard Skinner, I mean, whoever, right? Like, and, and you're like, man, it's great. Like, look, awesome selfie, right? Then you got backstage passes. What does it mean to see God face to face? It means we have, we have full access it means that we will get to, we have total access to him. Now, we will have bodies that will be made to live like that, to see him and see his beauty and power, and, we, and, and we'll have complete access. Now, today, as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus, when we pray, total access, right? We know that God hears all of our prayers. God listens to all of our prayers. He cares about our prayers, and he answers them. Sometimes it's yes, which we love. Sometimes it's no, which we don't like. And then there, then there is, hey, I hear you, but not right now. And we hate that answer, right? Like, give me a yes or no, Lord. Like, I'm tired of waiting, right? So, like, so we have a God who hears, cares, and answers. When we pray to the throne, and we, we approach the throne of grace, Hebrews chapter 4, God, we have total access. There's nothing hindering that with us and the Lord. But however, however, Though we have access to God now, we also know that in this life, there are times where you feel like God is distant from you. You feel like God maybe doesn't care. Maybe you feel that God has turned his back on you. Maybe you were praying for something over and over and over again, and that loved one still passed away, or maybe you, you, that cancer didn't go away, or maybe you didn't get that job promotion, or maybe something, uh, maybe a child didn't come back home, and you've lost your relationship with a, with, a, with a child of yours. I mean, like, you've been praying, and you're going, God, what are you doing? And you're like, God, are you even there? Do you even care? Are you even listening to me? You feel that? You felt that way, right? Is it just me? Have y'all felt that way? 
Have y'all felt a little, sometimes you feel like a barrier or there's a, that God is distant, that there's a hindrance that's interrupting your access to God as a child of God. You ever feel that way? I think we all felt that way. We said there's something that goes on that, that kind of blocks, it creates a blockage, and we just can't, we're going, God, what, where are you? You know, the psalm, the psalmist David answers the Lord, uh, asks the Lord that question sometimes too. That's not an unnatural question. That's an okay question. God's not afraid of you asking that question. God, where are you? He's not afraid of that. You can ask him that question. You feel like there's a, there's a disconnect between you and God. Can I, can I just help enlighten us on something? It's not God who has moved away. It's us that has moved away. It's never God. When God promised that he would be faithful and his presence would never leave us, God didn't go back on his word. He can't go back on his word. He's holy. He's perfect. So in every situation, it's us. God is always present with us. Even when we walk away, God pursues us. Why? He wants your heart. He, wa he wants your life. He, he loves you with a love that you can't begin to comprehend. He wants you. He desires you. He wants to walk with you. So when you feel abandoned by God, it's either because we, we have moved away from him in sin, maybe some choices we have made, and we're, we're not seeking the Lord, but we're seeking ourselves. And so maybe, there's a, maybe that we've drifted, there's a disconnect there in our relationship with him. Okay, that's on us. Or maybe we're going through a period of suffering, a period of suffering, and, we're, and we think that God is doing this to us on purpose, and we're angry with God, and we would just assume just to walk away from him. We'd shake our fist at God. So out of fear or out of anger, we don't approach God in a situation that we're in. We don't seek his help. We don't want his forgiveness. We don't care about what he's got in store for us. Sin and suffering can be, re can be reasons that our fellowship with God is disrupted. And again, that's not God, on God's end, that's on our end. That God is faithful, forgiving, compassionate. And when we do come around to the Lord, here's what we find. He's been waiting the entire time. That you kind of pee like, like a little kid, see if your parents are in the room. You know, you, you, like, you just broke a lamp, glass shatter everywhere. You kind of like peek the corner, right? You're like, hey, are they out there? You know what I mean? Like you're kind of looking, right? And you know what you'll find if, that, if that's you spiritually? Is that the Lord is right there. And his arms are open, receiving. He'll, and he, he receives you back. There's no, there's no condition. He just goes, you know what? Hey, I, I still love you. Like, like it, it, it's, it's okay. And so, but that distance from time to time can be discouraging to our souls. It's like having an electrical stream. You, have a, a, you, you flip a breaker or a, a breaker trips, or maybe you, have an, maybe you have a FaceTime chat. I have a friend that just had a baby. Um, and um, when one of the granddads, when one of the grandpas can't be there to physically see the child, hold the child in person, every day, every day, I mean every day, every day, there's a FaceTime that happens so Papa can see, see his grandbaby, okay? Every day. Can you imagine if you were looking forward to that, that, that and then your, the FaceTime chat freezes up and disconnects on you, how frustrated you would be, right? Like we feel that in our relationship with God. We know. We, we, it, it's, it's frustrating. It's a hindrance. And so... But the hindrances that we experience here in heaven will go away. We'll have total access. That you'll be able to see his face. You'll be replenished. You'll be rejuvenated. You'll be reminded of his goodness and his blessing to you. That Tim Keller said it like this. He said, access to God is like this. The only person who dares to wake up the king in his royal palace at 3 o'clock in the morning for a glass of water is a child. And we have that kind of access to God. In heaven, there are no connection interrupted signals, right? You have internet problems, like we've had a little bit here at the church, 22 test runs trying to figure it out, okay? Connection interrupted, want to burn some things, okay? Just being real, okay? And so I'm telling dad jokes, but inside I'm dying a little bit, all right? So, so okay, things are, things are not as they seem in here, all right? I'm just being honest, right? So, so... Like, you have a little connection interrupted signal, right? We feel that way with the Lord. That's going away in heaven. Total, full access to God rejuvenates us. You won't need, 
you, you won't need an appointment to see him. His door is always open. The phone line is never busy. You will have all of him, his grace, his wisdom, his glory. It will energize you. There will be indescribable joy in heaven that you will, that you will see Jesus and, you will, and your life forever will be even sweeter, even more energetic, and, and it will be so much more joyful, delightful. The flowers will be more beautiful. The recreation, you're kayaking on one of the lakes outside of outside the New Jerusalem, and you're kayaking, and it's, it's crystal seas, and you're like, man, isn't it beautiful? You'll be so excited, right, because you've seen him. You go, man, it was all true. He was real. It, it, was, it was worth everything. He was worth everything. There'll be a joy there. You see him face to face. And the third relationship is this, is that you will enjoy deep friendships with people. You know, a lot of times we have shallow friendships because we don't feel like we can trust people, man. Like we don't feel like we can let people in. We don't feel like if, I, if, the, if people really knew the real me, they wouldn't like me. If people, really, if, 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 if people really saw the things that I struggle with, they wouldn't actually want to be my friend anymore. And so we have like surface level Instagram pretty, like shallow relationships. And they're not deep or meaningful. They're not life-giving. You don't go, man, I can't wait to talk to this person. Right? Like, you, like, do you have people like that in your life? I mean, there, we, in heaven, we will enjoy deep friendships with people. When you get to heaven, you will still experience the blessing of real, meaningful friendship. That you will love and you will be loved more deeply than you can, than you can right now than you can right now. And the people that you know who, that, that died in Christ, that you love, that they will be there and there will be a, re, a reunion with them and be so joyful. 1 Corinthians 13 says that love never ends. That faith, hope, and love are the, are the greatest, but the greatest of these is love. Why? Because when you're in heaven, your faith turns to sight and your hope has been realized. You're, the, you're there. So what, what remains? Love. Love, it's just an all-consuming love. Like every relationship, people you've never seen before, but you'll get to know in heaven, people you've never seen, it'll just be a, your heart will be wide open with real, meaningful love. Don't you desire to be loved by somebody? Everybody, nobody is too loved here, right? Anybody going, no, that's me. Too many people love me. Anybody? No hands, Right? Nobody's overloved here, but in heaven, man, there, there's a kind of love that's deep, a love that's strong, a love that never, it doesn't change based on maybe something I've said to somebody, now they're not my friend anymore or whatever. Like it doesn't change, it's a deep and abiding love. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 says, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. God made you for relationships. Now you have relationships with people, and again, sometimes they're conditional, you know, like your boss at work, you know, hey, you pay me, I'll show up, right? Right, like, hey, we're cool, like, I'll be here if the, if the check's there Friday, right? Like, like, that's a conditional relationship. But, that, but those are not the relationships we have in heaven. That God created us for companionship, to be fully known, and to fully open up ourselves and love one another. When God created Adam and Eve, it was for companionship, and it was good. So Jesus will be front and center of everything, right? And so he'll be, he'll, he'll be, he'll be kind of the, the spark that lights the whole place up, so to speak. But that doesn't mean friendships and love won't be there. Some people, some people will say, well, all I need in heaven is Jesus. Well, you do need Jesus to get there. <laughs> and he will be forefront. He will be front and center in heaven. However, love and friendship is, is a beautiful blessing from God that God's given us. And there's no reason in Scripture to see why, why it, it, it doesn't continue. I mean, Jesus tells us what the, what the two greatest commandments are. Love the Lord your God and love one another as, as you love yourself. John 13, love one another as I have loved you. So wait a second. So loving God and loving people go together, Jesus said. They hang together. They're interconnected. If, if, I'm, if I'm walking in the love of God, I will love you better, right? His love fuels my love for you, right? And so if I become selfish and I'm disconnected here, I won't become selfish and disconnected here. So 
So they're interconnected there in heaven. God blesses us with love and friendship. I love these two verses right here. I've never thought about these two verses the way that I thought about them this past week. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Think about this. The Apostle Paul is writing letters to churches all, all over the world, man. And he's writing, he's writing these letters. And he is, he's saying, hey, I, he, he tells the Thessalonians, I wanted to see you face to face, but Satan has hindered me. Like, I want to see you again. I want to I I I be in your company. But look at what he says in verse 18. Chapter 2, verse 18. First Thessalonians. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, I tried coming. I, 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 made, I made the flight plans. I arranged the camels, right? I had the donkeys on standby. We were ready to, we were ready to walk if we had to. I was walking to you. I want to see you, right? But Satan hindered us. Oh, I love this verse, not, not verse 19. For what is our hope or our joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our, are our glory and joy. Paul says, listen, I've tried to see you face to face, and if I can't see you here, I'll see you there. There's a reunion a friendship and loved ones and people you want to see and that you maybe you can't see, and it'll be present in heaven. There's an ongoing relationship there that Paul sees his relationship with these Christians, he sees it as a blessing. In fact, it's such a blessing that he thinks that part of his heavenly reward, his, his joy, his crown, will be the fact that he'll get to see him there. Is it not you, he said? Is it not you? Are you not my, are you not my joy? Are you not, are you not the glory? Are you not going to be there like part of my crown? Like in other words, in other words, part of my, the reward that I will receive in heaven is, is, is to reconnect with, with friends. Hey, what if you thought about your relationships here like that? How would that change your marriage? How would it change your, your, your friendships? How would it change how you treat people at work? How would it if, you, if you really thought that God has put other people in my life for me to love and for them to open up their hearts, and I, as I love them, they'll open up and they'll love me, and you'll enjoy that friendship. Isn't that beautiful to think about? That if, like our friendships are a gift that will carry on into heaven. Wow. In chapter 3, verse 13, Paul says, he, Paul says he looks forward to seeing Jesus and all the saints. So relationships are good, and they'll carry on. They don't stop here. So let's get specific about some relationships real quick. Let's talk about marriage. Will there be marriage in heaven? Great question. Okay. In fact, somebody asked Jesus that question, Matthew chapter 22. Will there be marriage in heaven? Hmm. So in Matthew 22, there's a group of religious leaders, teachers, they got their nose, like they're looking down at Jesus. What does he know? He's not like us. He's not as good as we are. And they're trying to trap him and get him in trouble. They're trying to get him to misspeak so they can catch him in a lie and be like, ooh, you're not the son of God. You just, you just lie. You just contradicted yourself or whatever. And so they asked him about marriage in heaven. They said, let's take a woman. And they said, what if, hypothetically, what if a woman had married a man and he died. She got remarried. He died. And that happened over and over and over. And she married seven dudes in her lifetime and they all died. When she gets to heaven, who will she be married to in heaven? The first one or the last one? All right. All right, Jesus. All right, what are you going to say to that? All right, what kind of question is that, Jesus? And so here's what Jesus said, Matthew 22, verse 30. For, here's what he said. You want to know marriage in heaven? Here you go. For in the resurrection, meaning we're resurrected, boom, in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever and ever times infinity. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like angels in heaven. Meaning angels don't marry. They, they don't do that. They don't procreate. They don't marry. Okay. So what does he mean here? So in heaven, we will not be married like we are here on earth to, to, to a spouse. But there will be a marriage in heaven. Don't get it twisted. We will not be married to, to people like we are, but there will be a marriage in heaven. That your earthly marriage here, husband and wife, your marriage here is it points to the ultimate love of Jesus and his people, the church. 
that our marriages are just test runs. They're just previews. They're, 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 they're a foretaste of the love that we will experience with Jesus in heaven. It's a picture. Our marriages here prepare us, the patience, the forgiveness, the love we have for one another, the grace we show to one another. That is preparing us for a, the marriage in heaven. Now if, you, now, if you love your spouse dearly, to hear the news that there's not going to be marriage in heaven, that sounds disappointing to you. Now, and if it does, if you're married and it doesn't disappoint you, I know a really good counselor. Okay? We can talk about it. No, I'll point you to somebody else. Okay? Right? So, so listen, so that, that, so that sounds, for most of us, that sounds kind of a bit of a bummer. I go, man, like, no, I really, we really liked her. I mean, I loved her. I committed myself to her. Like, I never thought we were going to, you know, forever and ever, amen, that old Randy Travis song. I thought we were going to kind of be together forever and ever. I thought things were going to happen, you know. I, thought, I didn't think it was going to go away. So I thought it was permanent, okay? But here's the deal. Here, here's the thing about marriage. I fully expect in heaven that nobody will, other than God, nobody will understand you or have the level of companionship with you in heaven that, like, like your spouse does. I think in heaven, there's still a special bond. There's nobody's company who you, who you want more to seek and to enjoy than your spouse, okay, in heaven. Now, that doesn't mean you'll be married, and, 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 but there'll, be, there'll still be deep intimacy and friendship. There'll be a companionship that you'll still enjoy. You'll just enjoy it differently. It'll be a perfect love between best friends. Like, you know, people say, well, my spouse is my best friend. They know, I, they, know, they know all the skeletons in my closet. They know all the ups and downs. We travel the world together. We've done all this. We've done, you know, like, like my spouse is my best friend. Like, that, that's, kind of the, that's kind of the deal. Or I hope, you, I hope, like, your spouse is your friend, okay? Like, I hope there's a friendship there. So, so again, counselor. So, <clears throat> so, here, so you'll just enjoy, it, it'll be a perfect love that you'll enjoy between, between best friends. And since there's no marriage in heaven, there's no sexual relations or physical intimacy in heaven, okay? Don't need to go into that, right? So here we are, okay? So, but, but your friendships with your spouse in heaven will transcend those human relations that we have here. It'll be even better. You won't even need it, okay? It'll be even sweeter without it, right? So, 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 marriage in heaven. No, but there will be a marriage with Jesus. So, okay, so, so another question. Will we know our children in heaven? Like, will they still be our kids, right? Great question. Like, will, like, will, like, will we recognize them and, 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 and have that, you know, unique bond with our kids in heaven if they know Jesus? Check this out. Answer to that question is yes, yes. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, there's a guy named David. He was the king. He killed a, he killed a giant named Goliath with a, with a sling and a stone. No big deal. So David said, okay, David had a kid with a woman he shouldn't have been with, okay? Uh, her name was Bathsheba, and uh, he had her husband killed to cover it up after he went to sleep with her because his troops were on the battlefield. Long story, but, okay, they had an illicit affair of sorts, right? Oh, they, she got pregnant, okay? And it's David's, it's David's child. Well, that child dies as a baby. So, that, that, it, uh, this little infant boy, this little son that David had, passes away. And David says this, <clears throat> verse 23, But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? <clears throat> I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. David's talking about his child here. He's little boys with the Lord. He knows that, and he knows that he'll see his child again. By the way, let me just also answer this question, okay? Uh, I believe that God makes special provision for children or people who don't have the mental capacity to make a decision to trust in Christ. I believe that, I, I believe that just based on his, on, his, on his goodness and his grace and his character. Okay, and so just seeing who God is, and I think David, David makes that same assumption that because God is gracious, because God is good, God is merciful, that his little baby infant son will be in heaven. And he, and he says, I, he says I, can't go, he, I can't make him, I can't bring him back, but I can go to where he is. I will recognize him. That's my boy. That's, that's, my, that's my son. I will see him again. And I believe we will see our children again like that as well. And so, in heaven, there's a sweet reunion that happens. 
with family and friends who die in the Lord. Now, you are, you are here right now in this room in White Pine on purpose. Maybe you're watching online, you're at the beach, or wherever you are. Thank you for watching. Okay, we are in White Pine right now. God, Acts 17, 26, God has put you where you are in the country that you're in, in the city that you're in, around the people that you're with. God has put you there on purpose, okay? There's a purpose for it. And so, and because of that, your relationships, the people you know and love and have friendships with, those were appointed to you by God. God gave those people to you for their friendship. So, these relationships will continue on in heaven. That's why 1 Thessalonians 4, 18 says that, he says, encourage one another with these words. Paul says it to the church. What words? That all of God's people, alive or dead, will be gathered to Jesus when he returns. And it'll be a reunion. And you have family reunions right now. Maybe you'll have one in the fall around Thanksgiving or wherever, and you don't want to go to it, okay? You know, Aunt Sally's there. You don't like her. She said, she said some other things about your dog. And you don't like her anymore. And Uncle Joe, Uncle Joe's crazy, Okay? You can't leave him with the butter knife at the table. You don't know what he's going to do, right? So, like, he's, like, shoving it like in electrical sockets or something, you know, just, just to, like, trick kids. And so you know, like, you, don't, you just don't want to be at some family reunions. Hey, can I, can I just tell you that, hey, the one that we're going to have with the Lord, with family and friends who have died in the Lord, it will be a sweet reunion. It'll be marked by perfect love. It'll be a place where when Jesus gathers us together, that all the best moments that we've had, all the wonderful memories we've had, it'll get even better. Perfect love. No more conflict. No more crying over, no more crying over sick loved ones. No more worrying about people who are stuck in addiction. No more anxiety about letting people down. No more, uh, no more concern about, about making sure that you said all the right things. That It'll just be perfect love, bliss between brothers and sisters in Christ. And by the way, you'll meet new people you've never met before. And you'll, you'll, spend all, you'll spend all of forever developing those new relationships as well. So let me, let me give you this, and we're going to stand and pray. <clears throat> J.C. Ryle, who's an old school, like, long time ago pastor, said this, those whom you laid in the grave with many tears, which we all have, you've lost a loved one. You've wept, you've cried. Those whom you have laid in the grave with many tears are in good keeping. You will yet see them again with joy. Believe it, think it, rest on it. It is all true. Your future with Jesus is amazing. And we can only find the very tip of the iceberg here. So let me encourage you. Your life, your destiny, everything is moving forward. And God has you in the palm of his hand. Your future is beautiful. Let's keep trusting Jesus together. Will you stand with me? So as we bow our heads and come to a really a time of response, a time of just being honest with ourselves, being honest with God, Jesus has a bright and beautiful future for us that you have so much to hope for in your future. It's meant to give you peace as you journey through this life on your way home, as you go from place to place and you go from situation to situation and you're not settled, you're very restless, you're not comfortable and you're wondering, is, is life, is this all that life is? And the answer to that question is no. There is more in Jesus. You were made for another world. And you can have that hope. You can have that assurance. You can have that promise if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So the question for you this morning is, do you know him? If, you're a believer, if, you're, if you are not a Christian here this morning, you can confess your sin and ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And the prayer to do that is, a prayer to do that is so simple. It's, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need you to save me and forgive me. I believe in you. And it, that simple, short prayer will change your life forever because it establishes a relationship with the person that can change your life. His name is Jesus Christ.
You have tried to change your life. You've tried to improve. You've planned for a future. You've got, you've, you, you sat down, maybe you're very organized and you've, and you've got, you got an itinerary, you've got where you want to be, your five-year plan. That's great, but things change. But with God, He holds your future. You can have that hope and you can live with that. You can live knowing today might not be okay, but there's coming a tomorrow that'll be okay. That can be yours if you give your heart and your life to Jesus. Ask Him to save you. He will not turn you away. He will change your life now and forever. If you're here this morning and you're a believer in Jesus, and man, you're struggling. Sin, suffering, family problems. Maybe you got some stuff that you're dealing with in and of yourself. As a believer, Jesus knows and He cares. He may not remove that problem from your life, but He will give you the strength to endure it. And eventually, there's a finish line coming where he, that you, whatever it is that, that you're battling with has an expiration date, that it's coming to an end. It will be okay. Don't give up. If you're a believer, don't give up. There's a better tomorrow. So what do you need today? Do you know Jesus? You can trust him. Hey, if you're struggling with something. He is, his hands, his arms are open to welcome you in. No other agendas. It's just forgiveness and grace. You can come to him. And if you got burdens, you can lay them down. We've got, we got, we got an altar open for you here this morning. If you're saying, I need somebody to pray with, I'll be off to the right. I'll, I'll be glad to pray with you. You want to know more about Jesus? I'll talk to you about Jesus. You want somebody to pray with you? Come and, at, come and ask me. Come ask BJ. We'll pray with you. We believe in a big God who has a, who has a big and glorious future. He's got you. He's got you. It's going to be okay. Father, God, we thank you so much for today. God, we thank you for everything you do for us. Lord, we are so amazed. We are amazed at how you, how, how you are changing our lives, at how you love us, and how you have prepared for us a future better than what we can plan for ourselves. I pray for the person here this morning that's not a believer in Jesus. God, today would be the day they would pray, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I, I need a Savior. Will you save me? Lord, I pray that somebody would believe in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. They would be forgiven of their sins. That you would change somebody's life here today. Welcome them to a new, real relationship with you. And Lord, for, for your people, for those of us who are believers, God, this life is so hard. All the ups and downs, it's a roller coaster, Lord. You know exactly what we're going through, and you care. And you know that the end of this ride of life, that we will step off of that roller coaster, and we will, and we will be on the platform of heaven. And everything that we suffered through and struggled with and we questioned and doubted, God, we know that we will finally be at peace in your presence there. So God, would you fill us with the hope of heaven? And may that give us the strength to face whatever it is we're facing. Lord, help us. And may we respond to you as we sing. We ask God in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, thank you again so much for this opportunity. Lord, we're grateful for your love and for the future that you promised us. And um, we will spend literally every day of forever amazed at what you have done. And so may you create some of that thankfulness in our hearts today. Lord, again, we're grateful. Thanks for Jesus. We give you all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe see it for just a moment. Hey, let me just say this morning, thank you so much for worshiping with us. Hey, if, you've been, if you're watching online, maybe you're out of town uh, or you're checking, you're checking this out later because you're out of town. Uh, thank you so much for, for being with us and, and, uh, and worshiping. And so a couple things before we dismiss this morning. First offering, uh, drop boxes up here, uh, drop boxes um, on the walls as you leave. Freedomwhitepine.org forward slash give. 
uh, if you'd like to give. Also, speaking of giving and being generous, uh, so thank you for that. But also, we have a we still have a, a few names or a few numbers on the back to school angel tree that we got going on. We're helping out 40 kids in the Boys and Girls Club. If you would like to help and buy school supplies for kids, no backpacks, just school supplies. If you want to help do that, there are still some numbers out there. And uh, when you pick up a number, sign the sheet, put the, put the number next to, the, next to your name, and we know who's got what number. So with that said, again, that's due by this upcoming Wednesday. So we still got time. Takes you 20 minutes, as long as you don't get distracted in Walmart. And... Uh, <laughs> And the next 20 minutes, go in there. It's all, it's all together. You walk in, at least on the east end, you walk in, boom, it's there. It's screaming at you. Back to school time, right? And so uh, you can go and you can, you can sponsor a kid and you can bless a kid uh, going back to White Pine School this year. And so if you want to do that, and, I, and you, you've done so great, if, you, if we want to finish that off, uh, numbers out on the, uh, on the tree, little Christmas tree you see out there. You go, why is there a Christmas tree? Back to school angel tree, okay? <laughs> Not a Christmas tree. But you'll see it again at Christmas. Okay, so, so, and the last thing really is this: uh, back to school bash on August Friday the fifth, uh, August the fifth, fr- which is Friday, from six thirty to eight thirty. We're having a back to school party at Bainberry Pool. So you're like, hey, you know what? I'm looking for something to do go, to kind of kick off, go back to school. Well, some of us are going to be there, and if you'd like to bring your family, we'll see you there. There's actually a slide here. Y'all see this slide right here? Now it's 117 degrees today. And so, uh, because y'all don't pray for snow like I pray for snow. So, you know, if you're a hater on snow, this is what you get. So, hope you like sweat. Snow or sweat is all you got in East Tennessee. So, praying for snow, especially during deer season. Here we go. So, so look at this pool right here. You see water? It feels good. Okay? We're having a party. We've got food, drinks, pool. Right? Come and enjoy it. Information's in your bulletin on the screen. 6, 30, 8, 30, August the 5th. Friday, in two Fridays, okay? All right. Hey, you know what? If no one's told you this morning, Jesus loves you, and we do too, and we're glad you're here. Will you stand with me? We'll pray, sing, and be dismissed. Thank, Father, thank you so much again for this day. Thank you for your many blessings in our lives as we go back to work, school, with our families, wherever we are. Lord, may we know and may we be just comforted by your, by your word, your truth, your love, hope, joy, Lord, we pray that you would just continue just to grow our hearts and change our lives and that you remind us every day of your goodness. God, we're so grateful for all that you are and all that you do, and we pray uh, your many blessings on our our friends and our church family here this morning. And we ask God in Jesus' name, amen. Sing with us. Holy Spirit.